So I just filmed an analysis of property in Reeves County. It was a property that one of y'all uh, proposed I look at. I put out there in a live video that I wanted to start doing analysis on a public forum. You know, most of the stuff I do is for private clients and it's private information and I'm, I'm not going to share y'all's private information. But if y'all give me permission to share it, then I would love to because I think that it's a great learning experience to see what I go through and see what I'm looking at and share that with y'all. That's what this video is today. Uh, when I recorded it, it ended up being over two hours. And so y'all will see this little clock over here. That's what time it is when I'm recording and I went way long. So instead of putting out a two hour video, I'm gonna put out a couple smaller videos. Editing Tracy here. We have part one, which was the Permian geology, the legal descriptions and how to find the property. Part two ended up being what wells are on the acreage, how to find the wells, how to look up the permits, and how you know what the pay decimal is. Part three is the definition of the petroleum resource categories, and then how that is applied based on risking and percentages to value property, and then actually applying that to the property that we're looking at. Also included in part three, part three is a fun one. We have leasing and permits and rigs, two versus three mile laterals, and then also a review of the operator, and then part four is looking at the reservoirs and formations, taking it just layer by layer, faulting impacts, how well timing affects the value, parent child effects, as they call it. Part five is the fun wrap up that we were all looking forward to, and that's finding how it all comes together to make a value, explaining what a net royalty acre versus a net mineral acre is, what the fair market value of the property is estimated to be just based on my rough ballpark. This is not an appraisal, a rant on comps and and then some pecan tree updates. So it's a long one. I think it ended up being just over an hour once it was all edited down and condensed, but I think this is well worth it. So enjoy. Hi, my name is Tracy Lenz and I'm the owner of Pecan Tree Oil and Gas and a petroleum engineer. I have a master's and an undergrad in petroleum engineering and I'm also a certified mineral appraiser. So now let's switch to looking at specific formations. So in the Delaware Basin, uh, that is this side of the Permian. We've been looking at everything on an aerial view where you can just see top down, but we need to think of this in terms of layers because that's what's being drilled. There's multiple layers. If you look at this green down here and just everything kind of around the green, that's what's being targeted by these wells. And so you're not just going to have one well being drilled and draining all of this. You're going to have to hit each individual layer because what creates this as a different, a distinct layer from the one above it is usually a sediment layer that's impermeable. And if you can't frack through it, like so sometimes you can crack that permeable, impermeable layer, but if you can't, then you have to drill another well into the one below it. So, and that's usually the case. Usually these are hard to connect multiple layers together, but it's been done. Uh, it's not the most efficient, but it's been done. So here's an example that I, I did for another client where it breaks up the Delaware Basin into the different tops. Now this is for a slightly different area of the Delaware Basin, so the depths are different, but these were those layers that we were just looking at. So we have the Avalon, the first bone spring, which is what BS is. So first bone spring, second bone spring, third bone spring, Wolf Camp A, Wolf Camp B. And then in this part of the Delaware, there's additional CD, uh, different targets below the Wolf Camp B. This just shows you if now we're, we're looking through a cross section and each circle is a well that's kind of being drilled into the page. And so this can show you how, if you were to look at this from an aerial view, you just see a whole bunch of lines stacked on the top of each other, but cutting into that cake, that layer cake, you can see where each one of those straws is hitting. This is just one mile wide in terms of how much land we're looking at. So this is one lease. This is so just an example in a different area. And so if we go back to the map and look at what's being what's being drilled around here, we'll turn back on all of the all the layers. Give me one second while I unfilter everything. Okay, so now we're back at the map and we're looking at here is our section of interest again. And if I switch the map to then coloring everything by what layer it's targeting, then we can see more of what's going on from a reservoir standpoint. This is gonna look messy, but I will explain it to you. Normally I have, I for all of y'all mapping GIS people out there, I do normally have legends on all my maps, but um, since we're just doing this on the fly, I don't have legends because uh, I'm not exporting the map, but I normally have legends. So this is, 
colored by reservoir. Now, some of these are gray with an unknown reservoir because they're just a permit and it, it you kind of have to dig into what they're targeting exactly before that trajectory is uh, filed. Once the trajectory is filed, I can just say, okay, well, that well is here. And based on my layer cake model, it, that means it's hitting this reservoir. But until that until that's filed, I have to either dig for it or wait <laughs> or guess. Let's zoom in. Now, I will go over to where y'all can see the, the legend for this one, just because it's easier. So just to for y'all for y'all's knowledge, there's a lot of reservoirs in the US and I don't even have hardly all of them at all mapped. I have the main ones, but there's a lot more layers to the cake. So now we're looking at mostly this pink color and the green color being drilled in this area. Green is this third bone spring and pink is the Wolf Camp A. Now there's, so I'm just gonna, we're just gonna go down in order. Okay, so if we only turn on the Avalon Reservoir layer, you can see that there is some scattered Avalon wells coming down towards the property, but definitely not being drilled around it in a way that I could say with certainty or even probable certainty that there's going to be a well drilled in Avalon here. If we think back to how we risk things, that's saying that there's likely not much value that's going to be attributed to the Avalon here. So let's go to first bone spring. And here you're kind of seeing something similar. It's a little more widespread. It's a little closer to it, but probably not the most value impacting reservoir for this property. Moving to second bone spring, you're getting a little closer. Um, there's some more activity being developed this direction. So you're probably gonna start getting some probable and possible reserves value added to the property here. Typically in order for proved reserve value to be added, you have to be within a mile of a, of a known producer. That's just kind of the rule of thumb and good practices to, is that it's, it's the next location over or the next section over is, is as far as you can get without proved being stretched too far, unless you're in a very heavily populated area. You're probably getting some probable and possible reserves from the second bone spring. And then if we go to the third bone spring, now we're starting to get more interesting, right? So the third bone spring is more widely spread. It's more tested, it's developed. We are, um, okay, so now we can see our property a little better with that, with the yellow star. So now we're seeing a little more activity around and you can see that there's, there are wells very close. You're probably getting proved, proved value, proved reserves, which has that much lower discount factor, the lower risk that's applied to it, starting to affect your value. And then if we go to Wolf Camp A, now you're really seeing where most of the value is coming from. So Wolf Camp A is developed very strongly in the Delaware Basin and in the Midland Basin. It's a very strong bench in terms of production. There are kind of, there's a Dean, I don't think the Dean's developed, yeah, Dean's not developed in the side. More of the generic Wolf Camp wells. If I don't have it marked what type of Wolf Camp it is yet, then it's, it's one of the gray ones. So there's a lot of gray here. Most likely most of that is Wolf Camp A, just based on how many Wolf Camp A wells there are. So Wolf Camp A is where most of your reserves value is going to be. And just for kicks, let's look through the other. So Wolf Camp B, quite a bit of drilling happening around here also. So Wolf Camp B, you know what? I bet that green was Wolf Camp B and not Third Bone Spring. All right, that's the problem with having multiple colors. We're going to change this color to, I don't know, orange. Okay, Wolf Camp B is now red in this map clarity. So backing up, probably most of that, most of these wells are Wolf Camp A and Wolf Camp B. So Wolf Camp A being kind of the pink peachy color and Wolf Camp B being the red color. And then there's some scattered bone spring wells, especially off to the, the east, the northeast. There's looks like some second bone spring and third bone spring being developed over here. And then they might have been testing a couple different benches. Uh, oh, here we go. So here's, looks like this Laramie State had a test in the um, Bone Spring also, but for mostly it's it's other, other reservoirs. So Wolf Camp will be where the majority of your value is for this property. Um, Wolf Camp A and Wolf Camp B. Zooming out again, if we turn off all of these and we just look at Wolf Camp B, 
If we just look at Wolf Camp B, you can see it's, it's widespread across the entire basin. It's developed, it's established. Uh, Wolf Camp B is sometimes broken up into upper and lower. For this, I don't have it broken up into lower over here. Wolf Camp C. Okay, so there's some Wolf Camp C being developed. See if I include some of the other definitions of Wolf Camp C. Yeah, still there's, there's not... It's mostly just testing different areas or different areas where the Wolf Camp C was, was developed. Wolf Camp D. Yeah, again, sporadic development of the Wolf Camp D, but nothing uh, dramatic. Checking in to some of the deeper items. Yeah, nothing here. Barnett. So here's that Alpine High area where they're developing Barnett and Woodford. Let's see. Where's... So now just to make sure we have everything, we'll toggle all items and just get rid of the ones that we know about and kind of look through independently. And, you know, I have I have more efficient ways to go through this, but this is for our purposes, walking through this together, just so we can prove to each other that that we're looking at all we need to look at. And we're going to take off the generic Wolf Camp wells. And now we're left with everything remaining that probably were permitted and, and never drilled. So we're going to filter to just wells that are active. Well status equals active. And let's see how many active wells are left after we filter out the Bone Spring and the Wolf. Again, here's the Alpine High kind of hitting those other reservoirs like Woodford and Barnett. But near our property, there's really not a whole lot that I'm seeing that's not one of those. So I think it's fair to assume that if we look at just the analysis on just those reservoirs, we're going to be getting all of it. Okay, one more thing I wanted to look at was if there was any known faults running through this area because the, the Delaware Basin um, faulting is much more of an issue in very much in some areas than in others. If this was in a high fault area, that might make drilling difficult and that might be why they're avoiding it. I'm not seeing this to be a high fault area. So these brown lines are the faults. It's not their fault, man. Now there are some parts that are more difficult to drill and you'll see wells kind of avoid those areas, specifically over here this kind of ridge down here. And then sometimes faulting ends up creating little interesting trends in the wells. So if you can't figure out why a trend is happening, it could be the geologic structure that it's, that's guide there. People are avoiding it or not. And it also just, could just be the landowner. Maybe there's a river, maybe that, who knows, right? Some of these areas, it's definitely the, the faulting. It makes it difficult to stay in the reservoir as you're drilling because you have to kind of have that continuous feedback on if you've crossed the fault or not. And also sometimes being near a fault makes it very hazardous to drill a well because there could be pockets of high pressure or pockets of shale that can steal your drilling fluids or seize up your drilling. If you need that constant circulation of fluids as you're drilling, and if, if you hit a pocket that causes your drilling fluids to either go away or to get real sludgy, like think of mixing uh, oatmeal in with water, right? So sometimes you have certain clays that will just swell and steal all your water and that can stick pipe. If your operator was drilling and then they stopped drilling for some reason and scooted the rig over and started drilling again, they probably stuck their pipe, couldn't get it out and weren't able to get it out. I mean, they always try. Sometimes you, you uh, just can't. Like it, there's a lot of forces keeping several mile pipeline in the ground. If you think about just trying to get, you know, your irrigation out back, if you have a pipe that's stuck in the ground and you're trying to replace it just for your irrigation, just that alone can be difficult. But now you have, you know, several miles of pipeline in the ground. Like what if that gets stuck, right? Those drilling fluids are very impo important. So sometimes the faulting and the geology can make it difficult to drill for those reasons. But I'm not saying that here. <laughs> All that to say, I'm not saying that here. Let's see any other interesting views we could look at. Yeah, let's one more. Let's look at kind of the trend in when people are drilling. I'm going to turn off any well that was drilled before 1990 just so it doesn't clutter up the screen. And then because I think we've, we've fairly certainly established that we're only looking at horizontal wells, I'm going to turn off anything that's a vertical well, just so it, that, again, doesn't clutter up the screen. And then we'll also make it to where it's easier to see our property. Okay, so we're here at the star. And anything that is purple and blue, so this is kind of a, a reverse heat color. So the cooler the color, the... Um, more interesting, more recent it is. More recently, the well has been drilled. And then the hotter the color, the redder the color, that's 2010 is red and 2020 is blue, for example. Let's zoom in on our acreage, see what we're looking at. Now y'all can see the color scheme off to the, the left there. We mostly have greens. And if you look, greens is the 2017, 2018. 
So it looks like the well that is paying them was drilled in the 2017-18 time frame, which uh, looks like 2018. So yeah, that, that seems to be based on the information provided to me and that I, I saw in the permits. That looks right. So two things on this. We'll start with the bad news first. Bad news is that after about a year, the production from existing wells can start affecting future wells that are drilled. This is called the parent-child effect. And the parent well is essentially stealing the thunder of the second and third wells that are drilled next to it. Inevitably, these wells will hit pockets of pressure and oil that are higher quality than others and steal that uh, in a good way. I mean, it's good for the first well, but that first well will start kind of zapping the pressure out of this pocket here, like this line of reservoir. Now, that doesn't mean that the future wells won't have anything left. It just means that there's going to be a pressure sink running down the center of this section um, or both these sections. That pressure sink has a potential to cause the future fractures that happen next to it. Any future fracturing can cause that fracture to instead of creating a uniform like pop in the reservoir, it'll instead be channeled towards that lower pressure zone. And if anything, you don't want to be fracturing areas that are already drained. You want to be fracturing areas that are not drained. And so that, that ends up causing difficulties. It's not overcomable. I mean, this is something that the industry has been dealing with for 10 plus years now. There's strategies that, that we can employ. They're not, they're not 100% certain to always work. But in an ideal case, you drill an untapped area. And then the next best is something like this, where there's a big swatch of untapped reservoir, where just the edges are tapped. And then kind of the worst case scenario is more to the section to the south, where it's loosely spaced wells where there isn't really any untapped reservoir and everything you frack will probably hit something that's been depleted. So this is kind of worst case scenario, next best, and then something like this where most of the section is undrilled would be ideal. So that's just, you know, it's been, was that four years now that that well has been on production? You're starting to really kind of increase the range that that well will start to be influencing. So there's going to be there's going to need to be more mitigation when you're fracking the wells around it. And also when those new wells are drilled eventually, I mean, assuming they'll eventually get drilled, the longer it takes between that first well coming online and those new wells being drilled, the more likely that those new wells, when they're fracked, will send water to the old well and that old well won't be able to recover from it. And you might lose production entirely from the older well. So just keep that in mind. If you do get the new wells, you might lose the older well, but you have the new wells, right? So that's the bad news. But the good news is that I'm seeing recent and active production happening around here. So we have 2021, 2021, 2000. Oh, y'all can't see what I'm pointing to. So really things that have happened in the last year or two or, or what, what I'm most interested in. So let's just pull up the last three years or so. And yeah, like there's there's a good amount of activity around here. There's lots of mineral owners that would love to have this much activity around. And this is kind of showing the spacing. And this is this is good news for spacing too, right? There's there's quite a bit. Yeah, man, even just in the last couple of years, they've been developing Wolf Wolf Camp B upper and Wolf Camp A in a stacked manner. Like you can barely see it, but there are two wells on top of each other right here. So that type of full development is great to see and, and really plays positively towards value in your area. Again, nothing nothing bad here. I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about this area, like big fan of Reeves County. <laughs> what I was showing is the like a heat map of value based on the production from the wells and then also valuing each individual bench with the proof pod pass and all the risking. Type